Priority Dispatch Upgrade, EMT Charged in Coworkers' Death, Medicare is beginning to fine hospital readmissions, and we're going to take a look at the drug diltiazem in this week's tip of the week. If that's what you're looking for, well, you found it right here on the MedicCast. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the MediCast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of the MedicCast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the program this week. There is a great show coming up for you in just a few minutes. We have some exciting news items, some confusing and upsetting news items, and a news item that you might be interested in because it might cut down on call volume. All of that coming right up. And then, of course, we'll follow that up with our tip of the week, looking at the drug Diltiazem. All that coming up for you, but first, I want to remind you to check out the additional information, the resource links, and links to all the news items available for you in the show notes for this episode. You can find all of that over at mediccast.com slash blog. Head over there, check out the link for show notes right at the top of the page, and you can click that link, follow on through to find the most recent episode first, and scroll on down to find any past episode you might be looking for, and follow up on that information. Figure out how the things I discuss in brief terms in this podcast are open to you or not open to you based upon your own scope of practice, your own protocols, and instructional guidelines. So please make sure you do that. If you want to get back in touch with me, you can reach me here by sending those emails in to podmedic at mac.com. I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you, and I do respond to each email that comes in. So please keep those emails coming with your comments, your suggestions, your corrections if need be. All of that is welcome because you are part of the MedicCast community, and I look forward to hearing from you. There'll be some more contact information later on in this episode, but let's go ahead and get set up so we can get on in to the news. Well, the Richmond Ambulance Authority is back in the news. They uh, do good things down there and really keep up with what's going on and advance research in EMS. And uh, one of the things they're looking at is trying to improve the time it takes for dispatchers to get the bystanders calling 911 to stop being on the 911 call and get their hands on a cardiac arrest patient. You know, if you think about it, it takes a couple of minutes to go through the typical dispatch call program. Of course, during that time, we're already being dispatched. But if you have a cardiac arrest patient, heck, time is so valuable. So what the Richmond Ambulance Authority, in uh, cooperation with the University of Oslo in Norway, they went ahead and looked at the dispatch questions that were being asked, the the program, the protocol that's set up there, and they figured out that the medical priority dispatch system could be changed, streamlining the process and getting hands on that patient to start compressions one full minute sooner in the call taking process. Now you think about that, one full minute is a hundred more compressions because we're going to be doing compression only CPR when we talk to a person on the other end of a dispatch line. We can teach them really quickly to do compressions, get hands on the chest and start pushing, right? Well that's a hundred more compressions that get done before we arrive on the scene. And we all know that early CPR is one of the most important parts of that chain of survival. We need to continue to find ways to improve and it doesn't just come down to us improving our care of a patient uh, in the way we handle cardiac arrest, our pit crew approach, um, looking at our compression fraction, the amount of time we're spending on and off the chest during a cardiac arrest resuscitation. There are also other things that feed into that and this is one of them. We need to look at a system-wide approach and figure out how every part of our system can lead to a more functional cardiac arrest management and hopefully better patient outcomes 
more neurologically intact patients walking out of the hospital at the other end of a resuscitation from cardiac arrest. So this is really exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. The, um, the, they put forward this information to go into the medical priority dispatch system and the MPDS system has been upgraded to include these recommendations. So your system may be seeing this go into effect very soon. And part of that process is that um, the Richmond Ambulance Authority, the University of Oslo and others are gonna continue to watch to see if there's a significant change in patient outcomes as a result of this earlier hands-on approach to getting a bystander on the chest for CPR early in a cardiac arrest. Next up is a sad story about a death, line of duty death in South Carolina, uh, an emergency medical technician by the name of Belinda Gale Rivers was uh, laid to rest uh, in her funeral on September 28th. Sadly enough, her driver, her co-worker, who was driving the ambulance after dropping a patient at the hospital, has been charged with misdemeanor uh, death related to a motor vehicle accident um, in this particular situation. The by, uh, bystanders and witnesses said that the ambulance ran the red light allegedly and uh, they came into the path of a tractor trailer and Belinda was killed at the scene during this particular situation. Um, you know folks, I haven't reported on motor vehicle accidents and ambulances much recently, not because they haven't happened, but because I feel like I'm harping on you, but this is why we really, really need to be aware of how we're driving, what we're doing, and not become complacent when we're transporting patients and when we're going back to the station. Scene safety doesn't stop once you've arrived and checked out the scene at the patient's place of residence or the scene of the incident. Scene safety is part of the process you need to keep ingrained in your EMS soul all the way back till you're in station and beyond. And I hope you'll keep that in mind. You know, I, I'm sure um, Jonathan Brown, who is the EMT charged in misdemeanor death by vehicle in this situation, is just torn up by this. And, and our hearts and prayers go out to him as well as to the family of Belinda Gale Rivers, uh, their entire EMS community and responder community in South Carolina in this community uh, is just, I'm sure, all devastated by this. So we need to continue to uh, think about this and then take away from it what can we do to be better, better aware for how we can uh, not have something like this happen to us because really uh, this could have been any of you and any of us, myself included, if we start letting our attention drift, if we stop uh, doing the things that we need to do to stay aware and alert during our transports and when we're responding back to our stations. All of that's important. Um, again, thoughts and prayers go out to both of these uh, people, uh, both uh, the individual charged in this crime and of course the family of the EMT that died. Uh, it's just a sad and horrible tragedy. Finally, this past Monday on the 1st of October, guess what happened folks? Medicare changed the way they're going to reimburse hospitals when patients are readmitted for certain disease processes within 30 days. Now initially this is going to be limited to just a few different things, but it's really focusing on nearly the fact that nearly 20% of people admitted to the hospital are readmitted within 30 days. And that is awful, and often because of preventable reasons. So hospitals are complaining about this. They're saying, look, it's not all our fault. The patients aren't listening. The patients aren't paying attention to their discharge instructions. Well, you know, the hospitals need to start stepping up that process. And this may lead back to us as well in a couple of different ways. EMS services may be transporting patients from the hospital home and taking them home, we should be aware of what their discharge instructions are and we should be asking them some key questions. Hey, do you, did you understand what the nurse was talking about? And if the answer is no, you need to encourage that patient or their family member to call back to the hospital and to ask for a nurse to go over those instructions again. The other side of this is, 
This process is going to cause hospitals to do a lot of follow-up care, a lot better job of managing these patients both at the time of discharge and when they get home. And hopefully, for us in EMS, this means we're going to have a, just a few fewer trips to the hospital. I think that's important to keep in mind that this is going to save money all the way around. Medicare looked at what this cost the system and they included the cost of readmission, retransport by ambulance and all of that as part of it. So we're going to have a, a couple fewer trips maybe out of this. Uh, but we need to be part of the system. Again, just like I talked about back in that looking at cardiac arrest as a system-wide approach to cardiac arrest, we need to have a system-wide approach to healthcare reform. And that includes us as part of the healthcare system. So look at ways that you can help patients better acclimate to going home after they're at the hospital. And if you see something that's a problem, report it back to your hospital. Find out who the nurse manager is, talk to the charge nurse in the emergency department and say, hey, you know, I noticed this. Is there possibly a way you can keep the patient from having this problem when they get home? It might keep them from getting readmitted. That is a hot button issue right now in many, many hospitals. About two thirds of hospitals are expected to incur some kind of penalty as a result of this change in Medicare billing, and the average penalty is expected to be around $125,000. And that penalty amount will go up as a percentage of their total Medicare billing related to readmissions over the next few years. So we're gonna have to see how this progresses with the hospitals, but we need to be a proactive part of this system. Time now for this week's tip of the week, and we're going to review the medication diltiazem. We've been looking at antiarrhythmic drugs over the last few weeks, primarily focusing on amiodarone and lidocaine and ventricular arrhythmias. But what about those confounded atrial arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? Well, guess what, folks? We've got a drug for you. So let's go ahead and take a look at diltiazem, or the brand name, Cardizem. For this week's tip of the week, we're going to be looking at diltiazem or cardizem in our EMS med review of the week. We're going to be looking at the mechanism and class of this medication, the indications and contraindications, side effects and precautions, and interactions. And finally, common dosages you might see. And this will be an ACLS medication, so most of the doses I discuss here are probably within the range of what you have in your protocols. Uh, if you're following strict ACLS, uh, you should be fine. If, if you're not, um, as always, refer to your own protocols for the dosages. So mechanism of injury for this drug, it's a calcium channel blocker. It's uh, just like verapamil is a calcium channel blocker and, and some others out there, uh, this particular calcium channel blocker is useful in how it uh, basically slows down uh, the response uh, of the heart muscle. It inhibits the potassium movement across the cell walls, and this slows down cardiac conduction and slows the ventricular rate. So if you have a rapid atrial rate, it's going to reduce the uh, time it takes. Uh, it slows down the ability of the, the heart muscle to repolarize and contract again. So as it does that and slows down the calcium flow back, in, uh, back across the cell walls, it's going to take care of that. It's indicated in symptomatic atrial fibrillation, symptomatic atrial flutter. And when I say symptomatic, I, I mean that you're talking about patients with chest pain, with shortness of breath, de decreased level of consciousness or hypotension. Uh, what are we thinking about? Why do we have to have a symptomatic patient? Uh, do we do well, first of all, we treat the patient with problems. A patient that's stable, we don't necessarily treat them. We want to you know, look at other means to manage them, get them to the hospital, and let them have other treatment programs. In, in atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, it's especially important because the atrial chambers are not uh, contracting correctly. They are, they are collecting pools of blood in the corners, let's say, call it the corners. And, and those areas are slowly coagulating so that they are building up clots. And as long as we don't disturb those clots, we should be fine. If we do something to slow the atrial rate down, slow the conduction rate down so that the atrial 
walls begin to contract more effectively, we're just going to push that clotted blood into the ventricles and out into the body. We don't want to do that unless it's absolutely necessary for us to risk that throwing of a clot. And we could have a patient with a pulmonary embolism. We could have a patient with a stroke. Uh, there's just lots of problems. So we don't want to do this unless it's absolutely necessary. So we want a patient that is in cardiac compromise, in extremis. We want to make sure we're on top of that. Um, a good indicator I've always heard is pulmonary congestion. If this patient is not pumping blood effectively because of this rapid atrial rate, and uh, there's just not enough preload in the ventricles to pump out effectively, um, we end up with some, some uh, you know, pulmonary congestion, signs of heart failure as related to this particular problem. So you need to understand that. Contraindications, hypotension. Anyone in my protocols, it's below 90 systolic. Uh, you want to make sure you're aware of that. Again, we don't want to remove any kind of escape pathway for the heart to continue beating effectively. If they're already hypotensive, we may not want to uh, treat this patient. If we have a patient with a third degree heart block, we don't want to take away that ventricular rhythm that is supporting them right now. It doesn't matter if they have atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. If they have a third degree heart block, none of that's getting through to the ventricles anyway. So all that we have left is the ventricular pacemaker running things, and we don't want to do anything to compromise that. Patients who are hypersensitive to the drug, as with any drug, that is, you know, always in there, but it's important to mention it. Patients less than 12 years of age, this is indicated only for adult cardiac patients, and for cardiac patients. Generally, when we talk about uh, CPR, talk about cardiac patients, we're talking about 12 years and older, puberty or older. Use caution with patients in renal failure or congestive heart failure. Now, wait a minute, Jamie. You just talked about patients that are in, have pulmonary congestion and signs of heart failure. Well, you need to balance this. Again, we're talking about patients that are in an extreme way. And in fact, in my protocols, I need to consult before giving this medication uh, because they want to make sure we have we are all on board with what's going on and they want to know what our transport time is and they want to know some other things that we have on hand to make sure that we're managing these patients appropriately. So it's important to note that uh, we want to use caution in these particular types of patients. Again, this is a this is a complex issue, and we're treating a we're treating a symptom, not necessarily the whole source of the problem. So we need to be very careful. Side effects patients are likely to see include headache, nausea, vomiting. Uh, bradycardia and hypoten um, hypotension. It should say hypotension if you're watching the video. It says hypotension, um, misspelling there, but you are looking at hypotension in this situation. And again, uh, these are what you'd expect to see, right, when you uh, slow the heart rate down, okay? Um, you're going to see the heart rate slow down. Well, if, if you slow it down too far, uh, the side effect could be slipping from tachycardia into bradycardia, um, and it could be slipping from hypotensive and hypertensive or normotensive into hypotension. So be aware. Uh, drug interactions. Cardiac um, congestive heart failure onset and the presence of beta blockers. And again, this is that additive effect. Think about what else the patient is going on. If they're taking beta law, um, labetalol or some other um, uh, uh, beta blocker, uh, you want to think twice before you give them this medication. Uh, just too many, too many ifs going on there, and you've already got something on board that's controlling the heart rate. It may, we don't want to take it down even farther. Uh, other calcium channel blockers. So if you have a patient taking oral verapamil or some other calcium channel blocker, we want to avoid taking, giving this medication. And I would say be aware of any um, antiarrhythmic medication that may be controlling heart rate. Uh, we don't want to be affecting that adversely. So take a good close look at all medications. And this is where you need to have that understanding of the, uh, the, the critical thought process and understanding of anatomy and physiology and understanding of your pharmacology because you're going to run into some things that I may not list here. Uh, so you need to understand exactly what your protocols are saying and new drugs that come out all the time. Uh, so you we just need to be aware of these things. Always double check. Also, uh, you may have to take precautions. Um, I always, uh, when, when calling this order in, I always ask for a concurrent order of 250 milligrams of calcium chloride IV 
in case the patient experiences extreme hypotension. Well, what am I giving the calcium chloride for? Well, if I'm inhibiting the calcium channel from flowing effectively with a calcium channel blocker, if I give the patient some more calcium, I will provide more calcium ions to transport back across that cell wall. Um, and so therefore, even if it's slowing, there's more push from that concentrate trying to move across the, the membrane, okay? Think about it in those terms. So uh, I always uh, make it a routine to consider uh, giving uh, a 250 milligrams of IV calcium chloride, having it drawn up ready on hand so that if I need to give it to a patient, I have it available. Common dosages, uh, 0.25 milligrams per kilogram uh, to a maximum of 20 milligrams, slow IV bolus over two minutes. Now, this is uh, from my Maryland protocols, but uh, I, I think this is pretty consistent. If you have something different or drastically different, please let me know. But uh, this is what I, I see. And so whenever I do these, I tend to fall back on my Maryland protocol doses so I don't get confused. Also, you can repeat that in 15 minutes if needed with a little bit larger dose, 0.35 uh, milligrams per kilogram, slow IV bolus over two minutes. So if after 15 minutes you have a long transport, you're not seeing an effect um, on the patient or not a significant effect, you can go ahead and, and readminister it 0.35 milligrams per kilogram and see if that converts. Patients over 50 years of age, patients who are hypotensive, um, consider only giving 5 to 10 milligrams total slow IV uh, bolus over two minutes. And the reason, um, you know, this again comes into that what is hypotensive, what isn't hypotensive. Uh, you may have a patient who's uh, 95 systolic, uh, but wait a minute, uh, that's not hypotensive according to the contraindications you gave before. And I'll say, well, yeah, but, you know, do you really want to count that you got the right blood pressure and it hasn't changed since you took it two minutes ago? Again, this is, you know, you're, you're covered under your protocol, but is it still the right thing to do? You may want to be a little more cautious with giving this drug. Again, this is uh, something, this is one of those things, you give a medication, you can't take it back. It's not like giving morphine and then turning around and giving some Narcan. Uh, you can't do that with this drug. It's on board, it's staying on board, and there's nothing you can do about it other than try to give them some calcium. Uh, and so you need to be aware of what's going on. So anyone over 50 years of age or hypotensive, consider a lower dose. Uh, in this case in Maryland, they, have, they um, advise a 5 to 10 milligram slow IV bolus rather than the 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, again, why is that range there? Well, if I got a 200-pound, you know, 70-year-old guy, and I've got a 95-pound, 70-year-old woman, I'm probably going to go with the smaller dose or look at, you know, where that compares with my 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. Additional resources that I used, again, I always use the Maryland EMS protocols, and they're available, available for you at M-I-E-M ss.org, so mims.org, and you can find all the EMS protocols for Maryland and, and a lot of other resources there. Um, also, you can look under jointemsprotocols.com. It's a great resource that has just general guidelines. Again, you need to understand your own protocols. So for additional resources for you, the first place you go is, it's all together, your own protocols. Uh, that's important to keep in mind. But these are some online resources that, if they're if they're the same as your online as your normal protocols, you can make a note of that, and you can go to these other online resources and look and see where I found information about the medication. And in this case, I also found some good information on this mechanism of action and how the drug works at Wikipedia. Um, I don't always use Wikipedia; it's not always the best resource. But in in this situation, the, the Drug information there is well supported by some documentation, and I feel pretty confident with uh, what the information I found there. If you want to find any additional information or direct links to these additional resources, you can find them all over at the MedicCast website in the show notes for this episode at MedicCast.com slash blog. Or if you're checking out the show on video version, you can check it out and get to that resource as well over at MedicCast.tv. That's going to wrap up this week's episode of the MedicCast. And I want to thank all of you for checking out the show this week. We have a 
great opportunity to continue on here and learn. And that means that you need to get back in touch with me and get back in touch with the information from this episode. And I hope you'll do that. Head over to the MedicCast blog. You'll find that at MedicCast.com slash blog. And while you're there, find the show notes link at the top of the page. Click on that link and get the additional information from the episodes and here at the MedicCast and follow up on the information here. It's your job to follow up on what I talk about and to make sure you understand how it applies to your scope of practice and your instructional guidelines. I'll take care of making sure I continue to provide good shows here for you and it's your job to make sure you know how to apply it. Now, I also wanna make sure you get back in touch with me. So send those emails in here to me by sending them into podmedic at mac.com. I look forward to to hearing from you and I do respond back to each and every email I get. So please keep them coming and let me know what you think of the recent episode. If you wanna get back in touch with me via Twitter or Facebook, I welcome that. And you can find me on most social media sites under the handle podmedic. So twitter.com slash podmedic and facebook.com slash podmedic. So go ahead and friend or follow me or whatever the case may be. And I look forward to catching up with you there. If you wanna become an official fan of the MedicCast, well then go ahead and do so. Head over to facebook.com slash MedicCast and click the like button right there near the top of the page and become a fan of the show. I post a lot of additional links, resources, questions for the listener community all over there at the MedicCast site and you will find uh, the MedicCast fan page and you will find all of that over there on Facebook. If you're already a fan, thanks so much. And I would urge you to continue to support the show by checking out the page periodically and if you see something you like click the like button on a post or leave a comment even better right every time you do that you share the MedicCast fan page with members of your extended Facebook family so I hope you'll continue to support the show and continue to share the MedicCast with people around you Before we head out, I want to remind you, we are going to be at EMS World Expo in New Orleans. You can use the promo code FP50, and using that promo code will give you free admission to the exhibit hall. So if you just want to head down and check out the exhibit hall, all the cool stuff that's down there, the new tools, the ambulances, the the amazing information that you can gain just from walking around the exhibit hall is, is huge. And so I would urge you, if you think you're going to be in the area of New Orleans at the end of October, beginning of November, see if you can get down there and I can get you in free just by using the promo code F. P50. You can head over to emsworldexpo.com and use that promo code when you check out for the exhibit hall pass and it'll clear that all up for you and get it for you for free. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. And again, thanks to EMS World Expo for having us down to cover their event. And thanks to Physio Control for having us down and sponsoring the podcast studio, which is always important. And we want to thank them for being strong supporters here of the MedicCast. That's it. We'll go ahead and close out the show. I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic. You can find me back here on the medic cast. And of course, over on my other programs over at promednetwork.com. You'll find all of that there. But in the meantime, please remember scene safety and BSI.